All right, hello zoology people. Uh, here to just get a little bit into the idea of geologic time. So I did upload a few videos on all the, the, the detail, the names, that kind of stuff. So I hope you did see those. Uh, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things on there. So there's all different kinds of ways of illustrating this. Uh, but I do think that of all the concepts we're going to cover this semester, the idea of geologic time is one of the most challenging. And it's, it's just kind of hard to visualize 4.6 billion years. How long is that? I mean, it's almost inconceivable. Um, if you can even just visualize this year, and you know, 2020, how much change, how many things have happened within... Uh, one year now, you know, 4.6 billion years. Uh, how many different things? How many little mutations, little selective pressures? Uh, all these evolutionarily or evolution and ecological type of, of aspects. All those, how, how the cumulative effect of all of that. How much change could we expect to see in 4.6 billion years? Right. So again, just want to highlight some things. They talk about the fossil record. Um, I don't want to get super bogged down in all of the different epochs and the different eras and all that, but you're going to hear this vocabulary as we go on through the semester. Uh, most of y'all are familiar with the Jurassic uh, sort of idea, the Jurassic Park, that kind of stuff, but um, there is some relevance, different species, different organisms, different groups, different phyla. Uh, did originate at different times in the past. And depending on when you originated as a species, it's going to determine what ecological interactions you underwent. And, and it just it kind of domino effects through there. So again, a lot of different ways to, to illustrate, again, the different eras, the periods. Um, so just the idea that there has been a lot of change over time. So... For this semester, we don't get through all of the detail, right? So you can start to see some of the early fishes and Devonian. So we're going to kind of basically begin sort of around this area as we begin with our Agnathan groups and the Eurochordates and that kind of thing as we get onwards here. So um, again, a lot of time, a lot of time to to kind of accumulate changes at the genetic level. And uh, we, we are very egotistical as a species. We think, man, well, this is it, right? But I suspect we'll be long gone and the earth will continue for another 4.6 billion years. I don't know how long after, you know, we won't be around, but uh, this little ball keeps spinning around the sun and, and, and just keeps going, right? Regardless of what species is the dominant species at the time, uh, and like everything that's been dominant for a while, eventually, you know, is removed, is goes extinct. So again, there's a lot of change that will happen even after we're gone. Um, one of the videos that I uploaded, the link, the YouTube link, um, I like that it shows the idea of 4.6 billion years as a football field. That thing, that's a neat, uh, a neat sort of analogy. This is kind of similar, but showing sort of one revolution in one hour here, right? So uh, we see that if the earth formed here at sort of at one second, uh, there's the idea that maybe life originated here at about nine minutes. Uh, we start to see the first evidence of fossils at about 13, uh, first bacteria, but then look at this huge gap, right? So a lot of things were happening, it just not necessarily evident in the fossil record here. Uh, we start to see the first eukaryotic cells at about 40 minutes, first seaweed, 41. So we start to see the animals, jellyfish, um, sea life. And then this is significant. We start to see fossil evidence of the first fish. So at 53, so where are we at? We're about way up here. So at about 53 minutes, um, plants which then opened up the the biomes the habitat for some of the sort of early animals the insects 
And then we have now our amphibians, 55, 22, reptiles, 55, 42, uh, big extinction event. Or oh, there's our dinosaurs, 57, mammals, 57, 07, birds, 57, 59, uh, the big Mesozoic extinctions, goodbye, you know, big creatures there. And then we have our human, first human ancestors, and then finally the first modern man, first modern human, right? So 59, 59.9. We've just, blip, we've just been on planet Earth for just a little blip as far as the planet is concerned. The planet's seen all kinds of things rise and fall, change. Um, so again, we are arguably a dominant species at this time. But for how long? How long will our little blip uh, remain? Um, we are definitely causing a huge impact in the short time that we're here, right? We're, we're causing all kinds of chaos around us. Um, but again, planet Earth is pretty good at, at, at dealing with chaos. Um, and planet Earth is going to continue on. You know, whatever good things we do, whatever bad things we do, uh, the bad things will have an impact on us and on other species. Uh, but understand that the planet itself has has been this uh, this scene of, of change, right? So we know a little bit about the idea of continental drift. So plate tectonics. So the the solid ground that you're standing on right now is not actually solid, right? We're, we're kind of surfing on this sea of molten rock of of magma. And if we go back 200 million years ago we see that the earth looks something like this. This is going to have a big impact on species that arose at that time. Yeah? So they would have had access to the entire landmass, what they would call Pangaea. Over time, 90 million years ago, we start to see change. This, these tectonic plates separate or these tectonic plates start to sort of um, you know, arrive together. And then at the present day, we see our current uh, position of the continents. But even today, our Atlantic Ocean is separating a little bit each day. Pacific Ocean is getting a little bit narrower each day. So there's going to be change. And, and um, this is like, kind of like this idea of homeostasis, right? Our body tries to maintain homeostasis. If we get a little bit hot, we start to sweat. We get a little bit cold, we start to shiver. So there is a sort of homeostatic aspect with planet Earth. If there's too much pressure between two plates, well, they shift, right? We have this you know, destructive earthquake, but it kind of relieves that pressure. There's a volcano with too much pressure, it erupts, right? And again, this idea of sort of global homeostasis, and I would venture to say that right now the planet Earth is not in our homeostatic or its homeostatic point. So a lot of changes going on, a lot of uh, global issues that somehow, some way, the Earth will get back to its state, regardless of, of who's affected in that process. So um, to talk a little bit about the fossil record. So we have all these layers here in El Paso. We have a really good uh, fossil sort of history. If we go up to the Franklin Mountains, there's a lot of these layers of fossils of, of rock, different sedimentary layers there. So we know that these things have taken a long time to, you know, to occur, right? So at one point, we can say the Grand Canyon was a flat piece of land, right? And over time, the water sort of eroded its way down, and we have now these different types of situations. Here in El Paso, a lot of the the fossils we find up in the Franklin Mountains are like underwater creatures. You think, how could a little underwater creature be way on top of the Franklin Mountains? Well, a lot of that was at one point underwater and it's been forced upward through tectonic uh, sort of activity. So change in the land translated into change in the wild uh, organisms, the vertebrates that live on the land as well. So we have land that changes, water changes, right? Fresh water, salt water, salinity concentration. So there's a lot of changes that happen, not just on the terrestrial ecosystems, but also on the aquatic ecosystems. Um, these huge mountains, right? So they were not always there. Uh, Mount Everest is the result of two massive plates sort of colliding and that, that pressure is then released in an upward fashion like that. So. Again, modern day evidences of past 
or historic type of tectonic movements. So a very dynamic planet that we live on. Uh, and, and today we can go to Hawaii, we can go to different parts of the world and actually see new land being formed. Right? Volcanic activity spewing out this magma. And right now it looks just like barren black rock uh, in, in the future, right? Many, many, many years into the future, that's gonna break down into sand, which will uh, then allow seeds to establish, plants will grow, animals will inhabit. And, and we have what these we call successional type of uh, uh, of complexity there. Right? So again, the idea that things change over time and then we have this idea of biogeography. So life and then geography is like, like locations, yeah? So um, based on what happened in the land itself, it's gonna have an impact on what life kind of originated, how it moved, where it came from, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we're going to address these questions throughout the semester and it's going to be different for each vertebrate group. So what is the origin of the species in question? Where did alligators uh, originate from? Is it the same as where koala bears originated from, right? How long has that species been extant? Extant is the opposite of extinct. So species just like individuals uh, are, are sort of uh, quote unquote born right there there this new genetic composition of organism now is on planet earth so how long has each particular species been extant and we start to talk about geologic age in, in a lot of these species there how did that species get to its present location right so not necessarily how did the individual uh, we can analyze it like that as well but how did the species originate right how did kangaroos uh, get to um, Australia? How did horses get to America, right? There's these different sort of um, movement, migration, um, genetic drift events, all, all these things that can happen to put that organism in a specific uh, location. And then what factors genetically, ecologically, geologically play a role and limit that species range? So why are polar bears only found in the Arctic cold areas, but not the Antarctic cold areas? Uh, why are humans who were not really well adapted to heat, why do we live in El Paso and in Phoenix? And humans that are not really adapted to cold, how are they surviving in Antarctica today? Right? So again, a lot of these questions um, are, are gonna be things that we address and we try to make sense of throughout the semester. So, and we're gonna then uh, kind of get into the phylogenies. This is gonna be the next lecture I'm gonna get into uh, of all these organisms as well. So uh, with that, just a quick little background, little intro on geologic time. So hope that makes sense and keep an eye out for the next video as well.